Okay, good afternoon and thank you very much for coming to this webinar. As uh, Arnau said, um, uh, I'm Irene from Engineering Without Borders and I wanted to explain here um, the report we've made about, we've released a few days ago about energy precarity on children and teenagers. Um, first of all, uh, I think that it's important to do some pre previous consideration. Uh, one of them is why uh, do we speak uh, during the whole report about energy precarity and not uh, about energy poverty, which is a more used um, word or concept. Here, um, there are four reasons why we should speak about um, energy precarity. First of all, um, it's very important to consider that energy. The, the, if we if we talk about energy poverty, sometimes you would think that we're talking about only one of the concepts you will see here. That is household uh, vulnerability. Now, sometimes the, the inability to reach uh, and, and the necessary energy services is. Um, is considered like a, a household problem, no? And we con and, and we tackle it and we try to combat it uh, from household uh, unit, from this household perspective. We think that it's a more a broader issue that uh, energy precarity doesn't only have um, its co its main causes in household situation, uh, but in other factors as for example energy prices uh, you can see here how energy prices grew in Spain for the last years has also it's uh, one of the factors that determines energy precarity it's also the opacity and abusive conditions that sometimes our families face to have energy services also it's a very important issue how uh, supplies are managed here you have like the five uh, big utilities that um, own the the energy market in in Spain and also it's very important the relationship between energy precarity and housing access and the lack of energy efficiency in most of the buildings here you can see uh, the energy efficiency letter uh, from most of the buildings in Barcelona, it's E, so it's not a very, very high. So most of the buildings were people with um, most um, difficult economic conditions uh, have not um, energy, uh, an adequate energy efficiency, you would say. Okay. Uh, uh, we know, and I didn't um, speak about it because I think that that's not the main issue, that it's also difficult to measure energy poverty because energy poverty uh, causes different behaviors in families, like, uh, for example, having a cold house, but also not paying bills and having debts with utilities, and also, for example, having an irregular connection. So you have very different behaviors, so it's very difficult to have a global indicator, and there's also, there's always um, uh, very different numbers uh, depending on what uh, behavior you are considering. So, uh, knowing that, uh, for us also as a previous consideration, it's very important to say that's a traditional point of views or told us that energy poverty uh, would be uh, to fight energy poverty no, that energy poverty would be fought by uh, energy efficiency uh, like to train households into energy efficiency I think that this uh, map is very useful because this map shows us in the city of Barcelona the energy the domestic energy consumptions in households and we can see if we know the city if not, I will tell you 
that uh, the uh, in neighborhoods where uh, the economic conditions of the families are worse or are more difficult, the energy consumption is also, it's always, it's also very, very low in comparison to neighborhoods with a more wealthier economy and a much more big, uh, bigger energy consumption. So it's not uh, the energy poor, you would say, who are uh, spending more energy and the solution is not uh, to to uh, to lower this energy consumption but it's a broader one okay uh, going into the study um, so taking uh, into consideration all those previous ideas uh, the study had uh, as, as objectives uh, in in the, the report intended to deepen the analysis of energy precariousness, energy precarity, investigating its consequences in groups at risk of vulnerability. We've, um, we've do, we have done a report on energy precarity in women and now uh, we, we, we thought that it would be useful to do this report on the impacts of energy precarity on children and teenagers. Um, second, um, we wanted to propose specific public measures or policy to fight energy precarity on children and teenagers. And we wanted to collect and to strengthen the, vo the voice of the households in an energy precarity situation because it's very important like the, the, that the... Um, the witnesses, people who are living this situation of energy precarity, get to um, explain uh, the impacts they receive from that situation. So the methodology we thought about, it was, uh, first of all, a review of the existing evidence and data. Uh, second, interviews with families in energy precarity situation, but also with professionals working with children. Having workshops at school, uh, the information we could uh, discuss or collect in our collective assemblies, and we aim to target the population from zero to seventeen, so children, what we call all the time children and teenagers. Um, we realized um, that there is not much evidence on the impacts of energy precarity on children and teenagers. There are studies in Northern Ireland, in New Zealand. In, in the UK, but um, but not much. It's not like the main group that has been studied on energy precarity issues. Uh, generally, the measures to combat energy poverty or energy precarity do not consider children as a specific group of rights. And um, public authorities, they have the um, obligation, the responsibility to make rights effective during children and adolescence. So what we call uh, the best interests of children has to drive uh, the generation of public policies. And uh, we will see that that's not what happens in energy policies. Um, we looked at some data about the situation of children and teenagers in the city of Barcelona. Uh, what we found was uh, the following. First of all, uh, we found that um, the social transfers um, aiming to, um, to improve uh, the economic situation of families that, has, uh, that are in a situation of vulnerability, uh, they don't have a very big impact on children and teenagers. So as, for example, they would help um, elderly people uh, in case of children and teenagers, the mo the, the moderate poverty rate is uh, 36, 36% before social transfers and 29.6.5% uh, after the social transfers. So they are not managing to fight this situation of vulnerability with social transfers. Uh, second of all, um, if we look uh, at the... At, mm, more uh, Europe countries, you would say that when we have like those uh, this orange circle, those are the countries that uh, improve the situation of children at uh, in a vulnerability situation with social transfers. So you would have, for example, Luxembourg, France, uh, Sweden, Austria. They managed to do that, but in the other part of the graph of the graph. 
map graphic, you would see uh, Catalonia or Spain, and you see they, they, they don't get to improve this situation with social transfers. Then, uh, considering more like energy precarity indicators in the city of Barcelona, you would say like in an average of 15% of children and teenagers live in homes with inadequate temperatures. You, it's important for us to look at the map because there are neighborhoods uh, that have very, very high rates, like almost 35%, for example, in one of the neighborhoods. It's also important uh, to consider which survey we are looking at or, or, or we are basing our data. Uh, the map uh, is done uh, with a survey and the bar um, graphic with another one. And you see that the data changes a little bit. You'd say like with the other one, there's 11% uh, of families with children that are not um, managing to have adequate temperatures. If we look at debts, so at families that have arrears on supply bills, uh, the situation is worse in, in if we take into consideration uh, what happened years before, you see that uh, the, the number of families that cannot um, pay or, or that don't pay the bills, it's increasing. Um, the bar graphic tells us that we are in an average of a 20% of families in Barcelona that cannot pay uh, the bills and that's very high. Uh, and if we look again at neighborhoods, you would see that in some of the neighbors, we're almost at 30% of the families. So it is an issue. It is an issue that has impacts on different aspects of life of in, in children and, and teenagers' life. And we have uh, we proposed this, um, these four aspects or dimensions, um, physical health, mental health, education, and security. When we, when we talk about physical health, uh, we're talking about asthma, bronchitis, about uh, difficulty in curing uh, those illnesses. Um, there are some studies that um, have been done in Northern Ireland and uh, in the National Children Bureau in the UK that show uh, how children um, living in, in, in with, with low temperatures uh, have the, the double of uh, probabilities to have these physical health problems related to uh, respiratory diseases. Um, there's also a nutrition issue because we know that there is the heat or eat dilemma, dilemma so that there's, there are families that they are not spending what they could or what they should in basic goods because they have to pay the bills. So that uh, has, as a consequence, uh, bad nutrition in their children. And, and that is a very, very important issue when we are talking about children in the first uh, life ages. We have also to consider mental health. That's very important because uh, there are like some kind, some some feelings that are associated with the energy precarity situation of the family, like stigmatization, like guilt feelings, like uh, isolation, the difficulty to have uh, social relations, family stress, and that has very serious impacts on children. And um, as we've read, uh, in teenagers, the mental health impact is worst because teenagers develop new needs like social relations, uh, like the need to be connected to appliances, uh, etc. And, and in an energy precarity context, they are not able to fulfill these needs. So uh, they are also in an age where they need to relate with their equals. And they come for, and they have problems, or they have um, issues with their parents that are grow bigger, bigger with um, the uh, living in an energy poverty situation. Uh, in terms of education, um, there are studies that in that tell us that. Um, there's more uh, absenteeism, like not going to school because children are ill, uh, difficulties for home study, 
um, bullying also because of uh, the the not 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 having a um, shower uh, a hot shower because they don't have uh, those energy services at home and also we have to consider the security aspect the security aspect is very important because there are more and more uh, families that um, have to occupy um, houses because uh, the housing access in Spain is very difficult um, and those families uh, utilities won't give uh, like a regular access to energy to those families so they are they connect them say themselves to the to 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 the network to the energy network so uh, that um that has as a consequence uh, a very high insecurity problem in their houses for uh, because there's a big risk for electric ocean fire um, and uh, also a lot of stigma in cons in relation in consideration what the others would think or would say about your situation um, there have been serious fires in in apartments in Barcelona or near Barcelona uh, where children have died and 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 we think that it's a very important issue that's why we want to stop a little bit in this one um, in a survey done by the Alliance Against Energy Poverty, we saw that uh, among 160 families with irregular connections, one, there were 145 minors. So 70% of the families had children. There's a strong, a very, very strong um, and criminalizing discourse towards these families because, um, and, and it's not um, based in in true statements but in some falsehood falsehoods like you'd say like only one percent of what the common the, the utilities would call electrical fraud come from vulnerable families and most of the families that are occupying would like to regularize the supply and they cannot because they won't let them so uh, on the other hand you, you we must consider that energy needs uh, involved in the tasks of care and support of life are especially present and necessary in daily lives of children so families will will try to access energy either way if they don't let them regularize it so it's very urgent to reverse this this situation that as i said is more and more common um what we propose after after all the the analysis we have done, uh, we have uh, some proposals in three main aspects. First of all, broaden the detection. We have seen that there are um, lots of families that are in an energy precarity situation or at risk to be in an energy precarity situation, and they are not they are not detected. Um, so we recommend um, more coordination in children-related institutions and school and primary healthcare detection protocols so that uh, as we assure that children would go to school and will go to the doctor at some point, we think that it's, um, it's, uh, it, would be, uh, it would help to have protocols in those institutions so that we could uh, improve uh, energy precarity detection. We think that it's also important to have urgent measures to reduce energy precarity on children. That means no power cuts in homes with minors. We think uh, that there, there shouldn't be power cuts in homes with a vulnerable situation at all, but never in homes with minors. Um, and we need to, to that, that's some more maybe special, Spanish uh, issue. Um, Spain has very, very low social transfers to, to, to children, to families with children. We need to start to improving those social transfers and to create non-paternalizing social transfer. So social transfer that not, not conditional, but universal. Uh, and uh, third of all, and very important, we need to promote energy rights during childhood. That means that uh, we need workshops, we need debates, we need education in energy rights, and we need to consider children and teenagers as active citizens where they're with their own rights. That's very important. Uh, finally, 
uh, we don't think that we can address this situation only with social transfers or only with the consideration of um, houses with children and teenagers as um, no, prohibiting cuts or giving them money to pay the bills. We think that energy is a human right, so we need to ask or we need to demand a collective and democratic control of energy. That means energy from where? A sustainable energy source, not fossil fuels, not big extractive activist um, project. We need to ask ourselves energy for what and energy for who. We need to prioritize social and care and reproductive needs related to energy. And we need to prioritize energy for people and not only for industries or for production. And finally, we need to ask ourselves energy control by whom. Uh, that means democratic ownership and management. That means energy communities or collective and public ownership. Uh, we would uh, sum up with uh, energy for life and not for profit. And energy has to be ruled under an eco-feminist uh, perspective. Um, I would like to give some final thoughts. Um, first of all, for us, it was very important to to this question. No? Uh, we think that we must provide universal education and health to children. And we've seen that energy precarity violates both. So... W- why shouldn't we think of a dignified habitability, including water, energy, and adequate housing, so that we don't compromise physical and mental health of children? Uh, second of all, um, how do we expect that we would have societies with a quality of opportunities if we don't have societies that give basic provisions for children? And we don't incorporate basic supplies and residential security into those basic provisions. That's very important. We think that it's also necessary to ensure the active participation of children and teenagers in the definition of public policies. We have seen how teenagers with the emergencies, uh, with the climate strikes and with all the fight against climate change, um, they are like... um, uh, generating social movements, generating a new conscience. conscience. So it's very important to count on them as active actors. And it's very important that we abandon those individualistic positions where we think that um, the fate of children, the children's futures has to be, relish, has to be in relation with the, the, the situation of the families they are born in. Uh, children have to deserve the same opportunities, uh, never mind the family in, in, in which they are born. So uh, we need to think that, um, again, energy um, is determinant in children's future, in teenagers' future, and we need to think how we can provide them with this energy so that we are giving them equality of, of, of opportunities. Thank you very much. And now I'll give my, uh, the floor to, to Saska. That was a, a great presentation and a, and a very good intro actually to my presentation as well. So hopefully these two presentations will complement each other and we're going to have a nice discussion afterwards. Um, I will start my presentation with five key questions. In, um, in my presentation, I will try to address some of them, but all of this is an ongoing, um, ongoing, it's an ongoing research and any ideas, any thoughts are most welcome. So that's why I'm very much looking forward to the discussion after the presentation and any ideas and, and thoughts that you may want to share with us. So what are the key questions that I would like to, uh, to pose here today? The first question is, what is energy precarity and how does it differ from energy poverty? And I would like to thank Irene for kind of explaining one aspect of it. Thank you very much for that. So my job actually, it's almost done here. The first question is gone. The second question is, how is energy precarity a useful framing in the context of energy poverty among young people? And once again, a lovely contribution by Irene here as well. Um, And the third question is, how do young people use energy in a different and specific way? Uh, What makes them, is there, is there use very, what makes them, what makes them a specific demographic group that 
uh, requires more, uh, let's say, policy, but also um, academic research attention. Um, the fourth question is, to what extent are young people at risk of being energy poor? And the final question is, how do young people confront energy, energy poverty? And as I said, uh, of course, I will, I will try to do my best to address some of these questions, but please, any thoughts, any, any kind of contributions are most welcome. <clears throat> okay. So, why, I, why actually I started using this, this new concept or new framing energy precarity? Before I, I go into the details, I just want to say that what, I mean, throughout my research, what I have, have noticed or what I have learned really is that energy poverty is mostly, uh, has, has always been tackled as a domestic issue. Uh, and what, what that means is it, it is mostly about the household. The household income, um, the, how, the, the energy bills, bills of the household, and of course the energy efficiency of their home. So the idea is basically if you want to, to get out of, of, the energy, of, of, um, of energy poverty, you really need to do something. You, that household, that particular household, needs to do something in order to get out of, of energy poverty. So basically most of the ideas, and, and in many of the policy debates, there is that idea about household responsabilization. Households are responsible for their energy bills, for their income, and how they deal with their energy bills, whether they pay them on time, whether they have thermal comfort, and so on, and as well as the energy efficiency of their home. At the same time, the idea of the home uh, has been seen very much as, as apolitical. That means that the home is something personal. So as such, we should not touch it, but also as such, it should not be included in political debates about issues, let's say, energy security or the geopolitics of, of energy production or energy, um, energy distribution. So in a way, the home and energy poverty have been disconnected from other debates, very much kind of like high-level pol political debates um, link to energy, mostly energy supply, energy, uh, energy security. That, went, that led um, to the idea that energy poverty is a very much a domestic issue, not a political, not a public uh, issue per, per se. And um, one thing that really came, um, uh, that, that became quite apparent was the idea that these people are vulnerable, and we started talking about these people who are at risk of becoming energy poor as very much vulnerable. But we talked a bit less about the political conditions, the political decisions that led to such families or households to become vulnerable. And also, um, in a way, these house, households merged all of them into one picture. And why I say that, is, um, is one exhibition, but before I said that is, um, that's why I thought it's very important to talk about all these political interdependencies, social infrastructural interdependencies, and, um, and Stefan Bozorowski and, and Sergio actually have a great paper from 2015 um, about the kind of the interlinks between all those, all those factors. But in terms of vulnerability, so over a year ago, I went to an exhibition. You're going to see some of the posters of the exhibition. And uh, the exhibition was put together in order to raise awareness um, of energy poverty. And you can see some very, uh, some kind of like the posters um, are posters that we can see very often when we talk about energy poverty. So of course you have, a moldy house uh, with, with a lot of damp uh, and you have this family that is obvious that that is struggling and you say you, you see a very cute child uh, so of course this the, all of these posters were very potent and um, and they can kind of provoke very sad emotions at least I got those emotions but what I thought was missing 
from the whole thing, although this exhibition was done with kind of like the purpose was, um, was a really noble purpose. Uh, what was missing here was a bit about the context. Who are these people? Who made the decisions or what types of political decisions led to this household become energy poor? What happened? Where are these people? What is their story? So what, very often, that's why I say, very often when we, when we talk about vulnerability, it can become, it makes people like um, almost passive. These are vulnerable people and we need to help them in a way. But that is fine. That is absolutely fine. But what is missing sometimes is actually the kind of the preconditioning of that situation. And sometimes the kind of the political responsibility and accountability for situations like that as well. Um, so basically throughout my work, I was looking for a framing or a concept approach, whatever you want to call it, that will give me an opportunity to express the kind of the responsibility, the accountability of politicians and political debate in a way. People who are responsible to make decisions in terms of like who gets what and if Ren actually put that really well energy for whom and energy i mean uh what for uh so at the time i i i started reading a lot about precarity i mean and this was like almost maybe seven eight years ago so basically we were in the middle of the economic crisis and i was working on a project about um, on, uh, um, uh, on, on austerity as well. So economic crisis and austerity and young people. And um, I was looking for a, for a framework or for an approach as I said that will give me that opportunity to explore these issues a bit, a bit um, in a more critical way. Um, and then I saw that many critical, um, uh, critical researchers or, or theorists actually operate with this um, with these notions of precarity precariousness uh, precarization and I was wondering what those are about and what was interesting was to see that basically the notion of precarity um, is a notion that can be used as a dual uh, as a dual signifier that means is not only that it shows that we are all vulnerable or that we are all precarious in a way, but precarity means that actually specific types of precarity are politically induced. So energy precarity is a result of political debates, of political decisions, not of only some people being, um, let's say, or, or people who belong to um, irresponsible households. Um, so, uh, very often, these terms, precarity as well, they're also signifiers of uncertainty as well, of crisis, and we kind of operate with them when we are in situations, uh, in situation, in situations like that. Also, when we talk about our societies, very often where we're in the kind of different types of crisis, we tend to think that we are all in this together. I mean, the current situation, unfortunately, is one, <laughs> it's another example of that. When we talk even about COVID-19, as well as the austerity, it feels like we are all in this together and that we suffer, all of us suffer in the same way. But unfortunately, all these periods of crisis just emphasize or even enforce further inequalities in our society and show that some people suffer more and some people suffer less. And it depends on this kind of previous um, inequality. So in a way, it's a systemic issue. In terms of the energy precarity, sorry, I'm just going to go back a bit. Uh, energy precarity, I also wanted to take the debate away from those kind of individual homes, individual households, and to talk about energy precarity as a condition that affects cities and communities as well. Uh, it's not a domestic issue as, uh, only because it depends on green infrastructures. The thermal comfort in our homes also depends whether we live 
in a leafy green area or whether we live in areas that can be considered as heat islands, um, whether we have good transport connections or bad transport connections, which means whether our mobility is good or it's not. So basically, it's a more, it's a, it's a broader, it's a broader issue. It also depends on energy markets and energy prices, access to energy, connections, um, and, and so on. And when I said it's a dual signifier, although it gives, an, gives us an opportunity to describe something, it gives us also an opportunity to see the struggle behind it. So it basically it gives us an opportunity to talk about the different types of confrontation, not, sorry, not confrontations, but different types of struggles and empowerment um, as well. And we have many, many cases. I mean, we have a great, some great examples from Spain in terms of like how people uh, mobilize to confront um, energy poverty uh, and to make it, uh, to kind of like to make it into a political, political issue. Throughout my presentation, I, I really to apologize for the shameless promotion of some of the work that, that I've, um, I've published, but that is only to provide you some sources if you want to go and read a bit more about the research that, that I have done. Um, as I said, uh, especially precarity has been used in different contexts and especially in the age um, of, of crisis. And we have multiple crises these days, but also to kind of to bring energy poverty into debates uh, around, let's say, climate change as well and, and decarboni uh, decarbonization. So that was in terms of the questions around precarity and what it means as a, as a concept, we can discuss it further. But also there is this question just to go back to the topic, to the more specific topic and to what extent young people use energy in a different and specific way. Before I try to, to address or to share my thoughts with you, um, on this question, I just want to say that there might be a slight difference in terms of the different age groups. So while Irene did a great job by talking about children and teenagers, my work actually has been more about um, what I call young people or young adults. So people from 18 years, or, I mean, who, are, who belong to the age group of 18 to let's say, 30, 35 years old. And this is a specific group because this group has, um, um, has been missing from some of the policy debates, especially and from some of the, um, the research projects as well. So if we talk about this specific group, what we know about this specific group is that they uh, have special or uh, specific infrastructural arrangements. Most of them or many of them <laughs> Um, for, uh, many of them live in, in rental properties or sharing housing, um, working from home, and that is becoming more and more, um, more, and more common these days. Uh, students are a specific subgroup of this, uh, of this uh, group of young adults. And what is interesting for students is they also spend prolonged periods of staying in the home and studying. Um, although sometimes we think of students or young adults as being very mobile, that's not only the that's all, not always the case. And one of the key characteristics is that the, they have an intense use of specific communication and IT appliances. I mean, just, just not to mention the current situation, actually, but we kind of all depend on those um, on those appliances. But this is very spe very specific to that kind of. Um, that specific age group as well. Broadband, I mean, is becoming more and more important to young people. And um, according to um, a survey done by YouSwitch, actually broadband is even more important to young people than then light and hot water. Uh, and that specific age group from which includes people um, from 18 to 25 year old say connectivity is vital to the quality of, of life. I mean, this is our young people at risk of being energy poor. 
it's mostly about to what extent basically they are at risk of being energy poor and actually the extent is quite uh, is quite high this is just uh, a picture taken um, taken with a thermal camera and it shows the kind of like the poor energy efficiency of um, uh, of the envelope uh, of, of the house but also we we have uh, I mean many different articles have reported um, some uh, some uh, dire kind of like news in terms of uh, of like hundreds of thousands living in college rented homes in, in England. But what is more even important is that most of these houses are occupied by people under, uh, who are under 35 um, uh, years old. And uh, what is also important in terms of the political debates uh, in decision, think, uh, decision making is that there has been um, a real lack of strategic governance and, and the regulation of the private housing sector um, in, in, uh, in different countries, but also in, in England. And there is some support uh, provided, uh, but still uh, it's, uh, it hasn't been very, um, uh, very effective. Another characteristic uh, is, uh, or what, what um, has been discussed is energy literacy. And it has been reported that only 7% of young people understand energy bills. But at the same time, uh, the, same, the same survey actually has reported that young people are more interested in smart technologies and that provide, this provides some opportunities. And the survey has shown that people under 35 years old um, are twice likely to own or be interested in owning smart heating control systems in order to save money on, on heating. Um, there is some room here for further uh, and uh, some room uh, and actually some open questions in terms of like data control and data ownership as well, uh, which, which require further, uh, further investigations. So in terms like, I would like to maybe make some four kind of like key arguments. Um, so far, the lack of energy services in the home has been defined through the lens of relatively well-defined demographic groups and these are the standard groups of uh, um, um, in, in many countries there are like four or five or six groups of vulnerable consumers I don't like the word consumer uh, but still that's how they've been defined um, however in, in many very often in this group of deserving energy poor, we see older elderly people or, uh, or some different types of households, but younger people do not really, um, they, they have not been recognized as the deserving energy poor. Um, household rental properties, as I said, and most, are most common among young, young adults, and, but they, they, uh, rental properties very often belong to some of the um, belong to the to the building stock with the lowest energy efficiency. Um, young people are rarely considered within within energy poverty debates um, because very often their situation is considered to be only temporary. That means that if you are a renter, you can rent your house here, but you also have you you can choose basically like there is a choice, so you can leave that property and you can move. Um, to a, and live in another property. The problem is that most of the rental properties uh, that are available uh, to this specific age group, um, basically, uh, they still they still belong to the building stock with with really low energy efficiency. And of course, there is uh, there are different types of economic inequalities, and as I say, always different types of crises or uh, basically make young people even, um, even more vulnerable. So but how do young people confront energy, uh, energy uh, deprivation? Uh, sometimes we, we see some of the basic coping strategies like limited use of, of space heating. And this is, these graphs are based on some, of, uh, some, some research that that um, I with, and some colleagues did, uh, did in Birmingham, but also 
kind of curbing on their thermal comfort so they don't really heat their homes or their at least parts of their homes uh, to temperatures that have been recommended by the World Health Organization, which is like 20, mo mostly around 21 degrees um, in, in living rooms and 18 degrees Celsius uh, in, uh, in bedrooms. And also very often they kind of they rely on collective agencies so they spend, that's why I, I think that energy poverty is not a domestic issue only, because very often people rely on infrastructures that are outside the home. And that's why it's very important for people who are at risk of becoming, um, becoming energy poor to have access to such, um, um, such uh, infrastructures. So for different groups, for example, they, they spend more time at the university or at work, but also they rely on the help provided by their, their um, extended families or, um, uh, or neighbors. Uh, and I mean, what, what is becoming more and more encouraging and, and what makes me a bit more optimistic are activities, projects, um, done by people like, as I mentioned, like for example in Spain, like uh, some of the organizers have been involved in and the Alliance Against Energy Poverty as well, which kind of like empowers households and communities to fight for their energy, energy rights. And they try to define the access to energy as an, as an energy right. Um, what is interesting about this specific demographic, demographic group of young adults is that um, they have been marginalized in a way from, from political debates and they, they, they have struggled to make their voice being heard in their local communities because, as I've said, very often they, they have been seen, um, their position has been seen as a very temporary position. So one of, uh, I have a quote here from one of the interviews which says, by one of the young adults who says, even if we complain, I don't think that politicians will take us seriously uh, because people uh, or politicians don't pay attention to someone who is only in their area for a year or two. Although sometimes young adults or young people get stuck in different area, in the same area for many, many years. So some food for thought um, is that basic energy poverty among young people and children and teenagers teenagers is still a research lacuna uh, it's very it's very nice to see some emerging research and research like you guys did like Irene and your team to see that basically there is more and more research um, that is focused on this on these specific demographic groups um, what is interesting is also that this is still uh, there is still a long-standing acceptance of energy, uh, of energy precarity among young people um, and, I mean, which sees young people as almost like apolitical and that is changing slowly as well, so it's really nice to see that. Um, it's also nice to see that energy, energy precarity moves this debate from the domestic and from making people responsible for the situation in which they are and making it more of a political issue rather than of a personal domestic issue, uh, which is always an issue of self-control or uh, of self-control in terms of like that requires uh, behavioral changes in the home. Like these people use a lot of energy and very often we know that people who struggle basically use a tiny bit of energy. They don't use a lot of energy. And um, so far we have seen this issue with, um, with especially young adults and it has been seen as how they, we, we have called it injustices on the move because they move, their, they move those kind of like tr transitional injustices from one area to another. Um, but the current situation and especially kind of like some of, uh, some of the infrastructural, um, infrastructural actually situation and the situation with the building stock, with the building, uh, building energy inefficiencies, you, we can see that 
it's not really injustices on the move, but very often the same people, the same uh, uh, people who belong to that age group get stuck in, in, uh, in areas where they can find accessible housing. And that housing unfortunately comes with, um, with a range of different types of problems that can increase their risk uh, of becoming energy poor. And this is the last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saska. Uh, very interesting. Um, just let me know that uh, this last part of the webinar has been recorded. If anybody has any problem uh, with that, just write to me and let me know, and, and we will make it public. We already have some, some questions. I think the first one is oriented to Irene, and the other three are the both of you. Um, the first one is made by Willem Baker. Uh, it says, did your research look at the links between energy poverty and educational attainment? Uh, because there is some research that suggests a link, but it's not that clear. Also, we have this question of, um, these three questions of Monica, of how does gender inequality affect the impacts of energy poverty on children and teenagers? How can we address equality of opportunities in terms of energy for children and teenagers? And how can we better study specific energy needs of children and teenagers? So if you want to, ah, okay. if you want to start or Saska, as you wish. Okay. First of all, I, I thank you very much, Saska, because that was very, very, and I don't know the word, enlight, enlightening. You would say like uh, interesting, because the the all the, the the things you said about the internalized self discipline, I think that it's very important in the measure and the detection of energy precarity, because most of the people consider that they have the energy they can afford so um, uh, I think that that's really really a, a main issue in talking on energy poverty uh, about what uh, William said I didn't find a study that um, linked energy poverty with educational attainment what I found was a study that was talking about how um, children uh, like to, don't go, they, they, they are not able to go to school as often as other children because of uh, illnesses related to um, bad housing conditions but including damp also not only uh, energy precarity and illumination for example uh, and what i did also find was a study that related um, uh, the difficulties of study at home, concentration. The thing is that mm, it's very difficult to find a study that um, always relates like energy precarity, like the only factor, because usually families that are in an energy precarity situation, they have other situations that also had, have an influence in, in educational attainment. So for the moment, I didn't find, uh, I found the same, the same thing as you say, that there some research that suggested that there was a link that that could um, affect educational attainment as they are not able to go to school as the other ones, as they are not able to study at home because they don't have the same house uh, conditions, but not a research with uh, data. If it's that, uh, what you were asking. If not, uh, we can talk about it. And Monica, I think that this question, uh, even if it's children and teenagers, we could answer both if Saska agrees with that. Um, I think that gender inequality, uh, it's important um, uh, attaining to sexual and reproductive rights because when, um, and I'm sorry because I, I, perhaps I'm gonna be a bit binary now, but when um, uh, let's say women or uh, identified as women they have like some uh, needs uh, in the adolescence that sometimes they are more linked to some uses of energy as water etc uh, i think that uh, i saw but i cannot remember and that's saska uh, i'm sure she knows more about that that the use also of certain appliances of a certain related to uh, phone and internet users were higher also in, in teenagers, in um, female teenagers, I don't know how to say it in English. Um, 
And I think that gender inequality and a gender's perspective uh, is not only this consideration into wom women or men needs, but it's also a consideration into what purpose we use energy for. I mean, if we prioritize energy for um, care tasks or for reproductive tasks, then we are giving also a gender perspective in, 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 to en in energy uses and energy precarity. Uh, uh, as I think it, um, to address equality of opportunities, uh, we should uh, really um, have energy as a right so that uh, the amount of energy uh, a household receives uh, is enough to uh, fill the energy needs of the house so that energy is not a factor that affects health or that affects um, education or security for children. So, in my opinion, the only way to do that is to have a community-based, a democratically-based uh, control of energy so that we can really decide how we prioritize energy and um, which are the energy uses that we guarantee to families. Uh, that has um, a lot of ways to happen, like uh, from energy communities to nationalize democratic, uh, uh, nationalize utilities with uh, democratic and citizen control, not only nationalized, but also uh, from, uh, with control from the citizenship. But uh, for me, uh, even though if it's necessary to have like some social transfers nowadays to cope with the situation because it's really terrible for some children, uh, in a long term we should think about public policies to address energy precarity and not social helps because it's not because of the same reason that uh, I prefer to say energy precarity instead of energy poverty because it's not the family situation but it's the energy policy what we should address and. Um, and I think that to study the better uh, needs, one thing I couldn't do with the study because it was not that big report and we, we weren't able to contact and to do those qualitative interviews, I think that it's necessary to really involve children and teenagers you know, in a study and to know uh, and to be able to share their perceptions about their energy needs, about their energy, the energy policies they would, um, they would, uh, they would want or, or, or how they see energy in their lives and how they perceive energy. So I think that's very, very important to be, to be done. And I think I'll leave the floor to Saska and I'll read the answer from William. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I just sent a link to, to a paper that, uh, that uh, my, my colleague Neil Simcock and I wrote on on uh, on gender and energy deprivation. Um, but I wa what I would like to say is that our homes are a reflection of our society. If we have, if we have, do we have a gender equality in our societies? If that is the question, then we can see um, if if we if actually if. If there is that equality, then I think that we will have energy equality in our homes as well. But the problem is, um, I would not even see it as a binary issue because there are, there are different gender roles. Uh, the problem is that very often, especially when we have homes with, um, with single parents, it can be a real problem. And especially if we have single uh, female parents, uh, and Irene, as you gave some some examples, that can be that can, we can see actually that those households are at increased risk of becoming uh, of becoming energy energy poor. Um, it's also interesting to see how we try to reproduce some of the some of the things that we see in our society in terms of gender. I mean, there are some preconditioned. <clears throat> situations that we kind of reproduce in our homes as well and in different countries the situation may be different as well but very often very often there is a, an increased burden on on the female members on female members sorry of of households because of those uh, broader social inequalities 
gender inequalities in our societies. And here I don't talk about the global south, I talk about the global north. Um, because we have, we have real, real, not to mention the, the pay gap, and if we take that, income is one of the key, um, key aspects of, of domestic energy deprivation, and we have a significant pay gap uh, than uh, among genders, then, then, I mean, that tells us a lot about the real situation and what, what uh, happens in, in households. Um, why I don't want to take it as a binary issue, because then we go, we go back to that kind of like vulnerability thinking that if we say women are vulnerable, that can become a bit problematic because um, that can see us as, um, that can in a way, uh, take our agency away uh, away from us as well. Um, so, I, I I would like to see it more as a as a kind of like as an empowerment issue as well. Uh, there is that kind of inequality, but it it should be taken more as a kind of as a systemic issue. It's not a domestic issue only, and it's not an issue, and it's not even like. Um, a specific, I would say it's it's very much linked to, to kind of like these broader processes of, of inequalities. Um, and and I, I'm still surprised that even when we read like in schools, when, when we, mention, we mentioned education and when we talk about the role of mothers, sorry, I'm just coming out of my maternity leave. <laughs> so, but still the role of mothers and how the, the, what the role of mothers is in the home, in the household, and the regulation of paternity, maternity, and as, as well, because then you spend more time in the home and, and how you use the home, and especially in that home, if in that home you don't have thermal comfort, the expectation is that the mother should be the one who should kind of provide at least some thermal comfort to their children for a longer period. Because still paternities, even in the most developed countries, paternity tend to be a bit shorter than maternity leaves. Um, so I think there is that issue because whenever I say the energy precarity, I mean, it is actually, um, it's more of a hyper precarity that depends not only on infrastructural issues, educational, material issues, but it depends also on this kind of, as I said, political, but also the, the normative thinking about genders as well, and expectations. You know, there is this comment of Stephen Burak, I don't know if I'm pronouncing, if I'm pronouncing wrong the surname, I'm sorry. The relationship between issues such as obesity, anorexia, and childhood depression operating hand in hand with energy precarity that must be wholly interdependent. I don't know if you have any comments regarding this, this statement. Yeah, I think that that would be like a very interesting issue uh, on that because it's true that the, the, there could be a link. I didn't find uh, a link on that. What, what I did find um, about childhood, not, not about childhood depression, but when it comes to teenagers, in the interviews with um, affected families, uh, there were families that said that um, when their children grew up and, and they started to use uh, like more, uh, to want to have like more technology, use more appliances, more access to the, the, the technology, and they couldn't because of the conditions, the energy conditions of their houses, uh, the tensions between the, the teenager and, and, and the mother, uh, most of it the mother, were, um, were high, were, were important. And that um, uh, the, the, the adolescent, like sometimes they, they, they had like those behaviors like isolation, like um, conf uh, confronting or being angry with uh, his parents and most of it, his mother, uh, for her not being able to provide him with those social relationship rights through technology. I don't know if I made myself clear, but we found uh, cases uh, in, the in the interviews that explained uh, something like that. And what about um, Saska just said, uh, in fact, we, 
we, we looked at uh, some data here in Catalonia about um, energy use, not about energy use, but about household cores um, regarding men, regarding women, regarding the gender roles that were assigned into the households. And, the, um, and th there was a very big difference. And there was also a very big difference in the number uh, when we looked at people that uh, reduced their uh, work, their job, uh, time to take care of children or now with the coronavirus situation people that are uh, uh, going to unemployment situations or are reducing their time to work in order to take care of children because we don't still have schools open most of them are um, women so that uh, means that women uh, becomes the responsible of the household of what happens inside the house, not the private space. No, We link women with private space sometimes and, and men to public spaces. So we also saw that the, the, among the people that were asking for energy, um, uh, I don't know how to say, it, like social help, like money to pay energy bills from social services, almost 70% were women who were asking for that, um, for that social help. And that obviously doesn't mean that there's not a man in an energy poverty situation in the household but that means that is the woman who is in charge of this thing of the energy bills of the energy organization of the house in terms of um, of having a, of procuring energy to their family and i think that that's also very important and in somehow that it's also linked with children and teenagers because the um, mental health of uh, parents is very very important to determine uh, the mental health of children because if you live in a home with a big stress uh, obviously you're gonna have also uh, consequences for that for that situation and william i will read the hills report i don't know i i, I don't think i i found it but i will look at it thank you Yes, but uh, this, this comment that, that William Baker that you can see about that there has been this growing political activity in the UK among the young people living in the private rented sector. Generation Ren, according to the community union, prompted by the growth of the sector and the fact that this is the only housing open the most. Uh, they are both increasingly addressing energy affordability and poor energy standards as part of their goals for improved security. So uh, William Baker says that perhaps it's the cause for optimism and speaks about this uh, report on fuel poverty of hills and later on uh, Inigo Antepara uh, asks uh, according to what you said uh, Irene uh, the answer is yes but do you have energy services uh, lighting cooking etc and the outcomes disaggregated and the relationships like for example lack of lighting and problems when studying not being able to cook and bad nourished First of all, I would say that the, the, the report we did we don't ha doesn't have like this academic background and we don't have like those uh, numerical data. Uh, but we we do have some interviews. We did uh, a previous report on uh, a gender perspective of energy deprivation, and we did interviews. And from the qualitative data or what um, the affected um, families that come to the Alliance Against Energy Poverty express, uh, the bargain or the responsibility of all those, um, uh, the lack of lighting and then um, the, the children cannot study or not being able to cook or all that, it uh, has been always referred by the mother and has been always um, taken into consideration and brought to the assembly or to the or, 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 or to explanation of the case by mothers. So, ah, okay, that was meant for Saska. So, ah, no, ah, William said. Um, so we do not have it and that would be interesting. What we do have is some numbers that um, that say how many hours, for example, spend at home in household cores, women and men. That we do have because in Catalonia, there's one question in the, in the survey, in the let's say national survey that asks for that. So that you can see that it's the double in terms uh, in, I think that that's from two 
2012 and you'll get the double of hours that uh, women dedicate to household chores than men. So we presume that those household chores are very related to, to, the, to, to, the, the, to the energy, to the domestic access to energy. I don't know if Saskia, you want to say something about what Inigo said? Uh, yes, I mean, there, there is a lot of research done in terms of like, especially cooking uh, and, and ambiental air pollution and how this is a big gender, gender issue. Um, and more lately, it has not been only, as I said, because sometimes these debates, especially in terms of energy deprivation, tend to be uh, divided into kind of like, call them as you want, developing countries, the global south, but countries that are not in Europe or on like, let's say, um, in, in, Amer in, in uh, the United States or Australia, New Zealand, Canada. So basically all these other countries. Um, but the thing here is actually there is, there is some emerging research that shows that again, there is uh, some, as, as Irene, you mentioned that there are some kind of gender inequalities in terms of like air pollution in cooking, for example, on gas, especially in terms of like um, indoor air pollution, uh, but also in terms of lighting as well. I mean, um, all these separate uh, different kind of uh, services have not received a lot of attention, but we did some research in Greece in terms of lighting and how lighting in the house is very important. Um, in, and, and actually, um, like kind of like, we call it lighting deprivation. Um, and especially it's important for people, again, who spend a lot of time at home. Um, and also this is linked to some kind of new uh, building codes as well. So, for example, uh, in Czechia, that there was a special code in terms of the, the angle of insulation and how the house needs to be airy and, uh, and there should be some sunlight inside the house. Uh, but lately, that has been, um, that rule is not on, uh, it's not included in the, uh, in the kind of, uh, it's not necessary really. Uh, to have that kind of level uh, level of light in the house and that has affected many people because it has been reported that it's linked to mental health issues as well and if we go back again in terms of like who spends more time in the home tends to affect people more or those people tend to recognize this that issue more uh, as well but also we we found out that people who are involved let's say or who who have bed and breakfast um businesses as well for them that is one of the key issues as well because all the guests uh always look for kind of like well-lit um rooms and also kind of like airy and um airy rooms as uh, as well and it's becoming a crucial issue not to mention students and, uh, and as well, the kind of like this specific demographic group as well. Um, and children who tend to, to spend, again, a lot of time at home. Um, so lighting is, a, is an interesting thing because usually we talk about um, pollution, like light pollution. But more recently, we started talking also about light deprivation as well. Uh, and uh, and the life in the dark and it has been used for political purposes as well like going back to the life in the dark uh, and this kind of like scaremongering people with um, with back, uh, with blackouts as well as a result of different types of crises especially kind of the economic crisis um, and the austerity regimes in, the, in many countries, but also like in England, in Greece, in Spain as well. The kind of the idea that we can un, can end up um, living in the dark if we are not responsible again with our bills, uh, it has been used for, for many different uh, purposes to make people more responsible uh, in their homes. While again excluding them from big, from kind of like high level discussions on energy security and energy supply, and the links between fossil energy and energy deprivation and things like that, some market issues as well. Okay, so I think there is one 
one last question is so if you agree we do this last one question in the comments and 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 to conclude we'll let clemens to introduce briefly the um, the energy the right to energy coalition and and Gemma asks so which are the main changes or actions that you would like to see in the factors that you mentioned in order to solve energy precarity uh, which one would uh, have more impact i think you have the answer to that one i don't know i think <laughs> <laughs> no, I was uh, I was also <laughs> talking about the host as well. I mean, all these campaigns about seeing energy as kind of like an essential right rather than you seeing energy for profits. Uh, Irene, you are kind of quote energy for life rather than for profit. That says a lot. Um, but also, uh, as somebody mentioned, this kind of collective actions, uh, sorry, collective actions in England is kind of like um, alliances, collective of renters and people who always, uh, who kind of, who try to make this kind of domestic issues more of a political issues and always try to kind of to fight and to include them in political debates as well, in policy and political debates as well. Yeah, I completely agree. In fact, when we ask when we asked people from the Alliance Against Energy Poverty, like affected families, how do they, they cope with energy precarity? The, the the fact that they outlined always was that being part of a collective, uh, being not isolated with their energy problem, but being part of a collective, like asking for their energy rights, is something that helps a lot uh, uh, combating like mental uh, health problems like depressions and enhancing people to fight for those energy rights. I think that energy precarity is a society problem, so it only can be solved by public policies that protect energy rights for people. And that means from the extractivism, we cannot assume that we must go to big extractivist projects abroad to extract natural resources, fossil fuels, because for me, energy precarity, or for us, also has like this uh, climate component. We cannot rely on fossil fuels because that would that leads us to energy precarity as a society also. So from the extraction to the use of energy or the control of energy, that should be and um, that should obey to different public policies and that's the only way to combat energy precarity in a broad sense from my opinion yeah so we have one one comment of, of monica that, that, that she would like to to remark also the impact on parents when when they see their children are not fulfilling their needs uh, that we identified that in the alliance against energy poverty in barcelona the anxiety and depression of feeling that they can cope with energy needs of their children as essential and basic as as that is so if you want to comment anything on that or we can just conclude with uh, clemence Okay, so Clement, you can conclude if you want. Um, yeah, just to, just to quickly introduce ourselves, um, but also I really wanted to thank um, our two speakers for um, their presentations. They were so informative, um, and it's also great to see people discussing discussing in the chat. Um, and I also feel like momentum is really rising right now for a real change in our energy system, especially with this crisis um, that we are uh, entering actually. Um, so it feels like there is a lot of threats ahead of us, but perhaps also a lot of opportunities for people to mobilize um, and really change, um, uh, change the system that we find ourselves in that is um, unfair for people, but also destroying the climate. Um, and yeah, just to introduce ourselves, uh, because we, we supported the organization of the webinar. Um, I work for Friends of the Earth Europe in Brussels, but I uh, also coordinate the Right to Energy Coalition, which is a coalition that works in Brussels uh, at the EU level and that brings together trade unions, social organizations and green NGOs to really make that link uh, in a very deep way between the social and the environmental issues that we face. Um, because, of course, they are linked. 
and very often the perpetrators um, are the same. So the people who are destroying our climate are also the ones who are um, cutting off uh, energy supply from vulnerable families. So yeah, we came together three years ago to work together on these issues. And, um, and uh, we, uh, we've been trying to work both on EU legislation, but also to movement build and to make connections between all the different movements that exist in Europe um, to fight jointly together and learn from each other and support um, our struggles. So thanks again um, very much to Engineers Without Borders for organizing uh, and to the speakers. It was really uh, a great webinar with lots of participation. Um, it was great to attend. Okay, so thank you very much. And um, I think that's, that's all for today. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice evening, everyone. Have a nice evening. Stay safe. <laughs>